My name is Jessica Luther Rommel. I'm a PhD student at the University of North Texas of Philosophy and Religion. Uh, for the last three years, I've been researching white supremacy in Denton County, Texas, and I have to tell you, not intentionally. I moved here uh, in 2017 with my family, uh, and I'd been coming to Denton to shows and to art events for years from Dallas, and I was so excited to move to Denton, and I had this idea of what I thought Denton was, from going to shows at Rubber Gloves and, and going to shows on the square and going to houses and house shows and... In my mind, I just saw Denton as this place of really progressive, liberal uh, community of, of ideas. It wasn't the Denton that I know now. Now I know there are two Dentons, right? There's uh, a Denton of the, that I know, and then there is a very strong, powerful, white elite that largely controls Denton, Denton politics, Denton resources. Um, and I discovered that, it was about a month after being here, and, and we had come to the square several times, and I, I kept saying to my partner, Dave, I kept saying, there's just something weird, I can't figure out what it is. And then finally I was like, oh my God, I realize it. And he goes, what? I go, where are all the black people? Where are all the people of color? Like everyone here on the square, for the most part, unless it's at night and we're going to shows during the day, it's just, and then one day, we were walking by, right on this corner, right here. We crossed the street, and I looked over, and there was a black man standing under the monument holding a sign. I'm sure most of you know his name. What's his name? Willie Hudspeth. <laughs> Willie Hudspeth. And he's holding a sign, and he says, this monument is racist, and I'd never noticed the monument before. And I literally ran across the street in the middle of traffic. Not a smart decision. And he introduced himself to me, and he tells me the story of this monument. He tells me it was built by the UDC, and he, he tells me about Quakertown. And he says that he's been trying to get it removed, but he can't because they say the water fountains never worked and there's no water to it. And he tells me the, the laundry list. And I thought, well, I'm a student of ancient history. I mean, we can figure out what happened 2,000 years ago. Shoot, we can figure out what happened 100 years ago. That's crazy. So I started researching the UDC. And I started researching this monument. And you'll never know what I found. Denton's Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. I discovered an extensive history of Denton's Ku Klux Klan, and all from that monument, from investigating that monument. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. It pains me to tell you that I have enough contextualized history of white supremacy in Denton County that we could do this for three days, and I still wouldn't be able to tell you all of it. Uh, that said, I'm gonna do my best to give you as much information as possible. We're gonna cover about 1840 to 1930 today. Uh, next week, we'll go a little bit further. We'll cover the civil rights era. I've been told that the civil rights era was really calm here. I got news for you. No, it wasn't. They just don't tell those stories, but we're gonna tell those stories too. So come back next Sunday as well. So I wanna clarify that white power and white, uh, white power does not necessarily constitute white conspiracy, but white power is sustained through local manifestations and within the apparatuses and institutions through which it moves inherently and constantly redefines itself. My case study of Denton County to examine how white supremacy was homogenized into popular culture and continued through localized sociocultural systems and theopolitical institutions of generational white power is built on an, analysis, uh, on an analysis of thousands of primary documents, including an assortment of public records, social and civic organizational records and histories, historic press publications, clan publications, clan assorted literatures, along with a number of historical and theological publications and exegetical works produced right here in Denton. And North Texas's early history, like most of American history at large, is an undeniably racialized history. America itself was largely shaped by individuals who were thoroughly preoccupied with eschatological themes, the end of the world, that were revitalized during the medieval era. North American continent was seen by most of the early settlers who came here as a divinely sanctioned holy land, the land of the new millennium to come, the new Zion promised by Yahweh to a chosen people. And those chosen people were considered white Europeans. During the near two centuries between the first arrival of Europeans and the establishment of the U.S. Constitution, the impending end of the secular era and the end of the world was at the forefront of most early American minds, but 
most of them looked to this with an optimistic view of a new utopia to be built. America was going to be the land of a new promised utopia for a white, peaceful society. So in Texas, as initially a part of Mexico, slavery was prohibited in the region until 1836, when Texas declared its independence and formed the new Republic of Texas, at which point free blacks were banned from the state and slavery was officially legalized. After Texas's emancipation from Mexico, white Europeans from all across the South began to flood across the Red River into North Texas. And prior to this white encroachment, the North Texas region was occupied by an assortment of predominantly nomadic uh, indigenous tribes, many of whom had enjoyed amicable trade relations with Spanish and French explorers navigating the Red River for more than a century prior. Many of the earliest white settlers to arrive in the area were pioneer preachers. They were compelled by their beliefs in divine providence to challenge the non-Christian indigenous occupations in North Texas, which in Denton County historicals, these indigenous populations are often described as ungodly obstacles to white utopian society. By 1840, most remaining indigenous tribes in North Texas had, congreg had congregated together in a collective resistance against white encroachment along the East uh, Village Creek Banks, a significant northern tributary of the Trinity River about 50 miles southeast from here. And determined to rid the Texas territory of these indigenous populations holding out, the Republic of Texas initiated relentless raids against these tribes. And this, of course, in turn, sparked a lot of retaliatory raids from indigenous populations against Anglo settlements. And in 1841, Texas Colonel Edward Tarrant, whose Tarrant County is named after, was called to lead a militia of an offensive attack against the Village Creek tribes. And a Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal preacher named John B. Denton, who only had recently arrived to the region with his family, was one of several dozen militiamen who volunteer, volunteered to help rid the indigenous populations. And he was appointed a captain for the mission. Though many militia had tried and failed to find the exact location of the Village Creek settlements prior to Tarrant Party's group, the Tarrant's party, this group managed to capture one lone traveling tribesman. And when they did, they tied him to a tree and they tortured him at gunpoint until he finally revealed where the rest of his community was. And on May 24th in 1841, Tarrant and his party his captain, John B. Denton, located the settlements along the Village Creek. They launched an attack against the outer groups, and as they pushed deeper into the indigenous settlements, they slaughtered, imprisoned, and burned everything in their path. But as they moved deeper in, they were also met with increasing resistance from native populations, at which point Colonel Tarrant ordered a retreat. Despite that order, and determined to prove himself a hero, Captain John B. Denton pressed ahead. And that decision cost him his life, but it did ultimately make him a local hero of legendary status in Denton. In 1843, the last of the indigenous peoples who resisted occupying forces of the Republic of Texas at Village Creek were forcibly relocated to a Brazos River reservation. After Texas joined the Union in 1845, the state's new legislature carved up North Texas into several counties and over 900 square miles was attributed to the newly formed Denton County. The earliest pioneer settlement here in Denton County was from a Methodist Episcopal community which named itself Zion, a testament to their anticipation of the new millennia on the horizon and the certainty of the divine providence associated with the soil beneath their feet. This Zion community was comprised of very fervent Protestants and their preachers in their, own, uh, in their own materials are often described as well-armed gospel orators. And circuit-writing Methodist preachers who sided with the Southern Division of the Methodist Episcopal Church just a few years prior in their split, Reverend William Edmund Bates and his brother William H. Bates from Bar Barron County, Kentucky, brought this Zion community to Denton County during the early 1850s. And they, they didn't come with their entire family. Their father, Reuben Bates, and their brother, James P. Bates, remained in Kentucky, where in 1850, Reuben Bates enslaved a 30-year-old 30, a 30 woman, a sole 30-year-old woman, black woman, 
and their brother James P. Bates enslaved a sole 13-year-old black girl. But these Denton County Zion Methodists were self-described zealous and fervent Christians who were highly influenced by Reverend Bates' sermons, which you can read for yourself in many of the local histori historicals. They were regularly focused on the impending end of the world. And the city of Denton was mapped out and established in 1856. And though it wasn't officially incorporated into the county as the county seat until after the Civil War a decade later, but when it was formed, Reverend Bates relocated his Zion congregation to the city of Denton, and the region braced for the Civil War. The congregation was already highly focused on its end times prophecies, and as the war got closer, and anti-secessionist and, and abolitionist movements began to emerge amongst the immigrant communities coming from the Upper South and the Midwest settling the region, things in Denton, count, in Denton got pretty tense. There were many debates over whether or not to join the Confederacy here in this area. Um, and to be clear, I just want to take a brief moment to expand it out a little bit in case anyone's not clear about why Texas joined the Confederacy. Uh, the Texas legislature published a pamphlet in 1861 to outline their theological arguments for slavery and white supremacy, which they saw as congruent to their causes for joining the Confederacy. Aside from a rather lengthy admonishment of the northern states for their unnatural feeling of hostility towards southerners, Texas officials declared the state would secede for the Union for one reason, to preserve the beneficent and patriarchal system of African slavery. Referring to racial equality as the most debasing doctrine at war with nature in violation of the plainest revelations of divine law, Texas leaders offered a strong defense for practice for the practice. I'm going to read you a brief excerpt from that pamphlet of the Texas legislature. We hold as undeniable truths that the governments of the various states and of the Confederate the Confederacy itself were established exclusively by the white race for themselves and their posterity. That the African race had no agency in their establishment, that they were rightfully held and regarded as inferior and dependent race. And in that condition only could their existence in this country be rendered beneficial and tolerable. The servitude of the African race is mutually beneficial to both bond and free, and is, abundant, author, is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the Almighty Creator, as recognized by all Christian nations. So by the time the war emerged as a, rea as a reality for Denton County, Census records document at least 251 black persons enslaved by no less than 51 white masters, a pretty small minority in the region. This considered when a series of fires ravaged the properties of prominent pro-Confederates in the major cities across North Texas on July 8, 1860, abolitionist anxiety fully exploded among the pro-slavery populations in Denton County, including those who didn't themselves enslave others. The first fire was reported in the afternoon behind a store in downtown Dallas. Not more than two hours later, the entire north and west sides of Dallas's downtown square, along with half of the structures on the east side of Dallas, were reduced to smoldering heaps. The local printing press and every supply store on the city square in Dallas were obliterated. Within one hour of the first blaze in Dallas, James M. Smoot's store on the corner of Elm and Hickory in downtown Denton caught fire and quickly spread to neighboring stores. One here in the center had 25 kegs of gunpowder that simultaneously exploded, sent burning debris like projectiles across the square into buildings on the opposite side that also went up into flames. While many of these structures were saved, the entire west side of Denton Square was burned to the ground. Ruling coincidence out as a factor, Mr. Smoot's store in Pilot Point, his home, and many other prominent pro-Confederates in Denton County lost their homes to fire on this same day. A large flour mill in Collin County was similarly lost to a mysterious blaze the same afternoon. And not 24 hours later, several more prominent citizens in Dallas and neighboring counties watched their homes burn to the ground. So while there are a lot of false histories about the 
prairie match that caused these fires, let it be known, they were set intentionally by abolitionists. There was an uprising to resist slavery. But if we tell stories of resistance, we admit stories of oppression. And that's why we don't have stories and histories of resistance. Because when we have stories and histories of resistance, we have to admit and acknowledge a history of oppression. So the next time you hear someone teaching you or trying to promote a false history of a prairie match that accidentally caused fires, ask them how all those prairie matches across the county managed to time it within an hour. It's not true. So as fears of abolitionist arson were further inflamed by the fires spreading throughout North Texas, of course, the enslaved black population paid the highest price. At a mass meeting held in Denton on July 27, 1860, right here on this square, a large collection of residents within the city and surrounding areas adopted a joint resolution aimed at ridding the county of organized bands of abolitionists. And they were certain that these people were among them. And so they made a five-member Central Committee of Safety for the county. And this committee was charged with the task of finding the scoundrels responsible for inciting the slave population to the most barbarous acts of murder, arson, and robbery. Though fires had ravaged pro-Confederate members of the community, let me clarify, the historical archive offers zero evidence of these supposed murders, robberies, or attempts of murders. Regardless, their resolution expressed an explicit fear that white women and men and children were in imminent danger of nightly assassination. And so they made a unanimous pledge to find all suspicious persons. And this committee was given the highest authority, including permission to inspect all moving mail coming in and out of Denton's post office. And those tasked with rooting out traitors to the Confederacy wasted no time because news, agency, news agencies throughout the state reported that enslaved persons in Denton had confessed involvement in abolitionist conspiracies and several uh, secessionists claimed to have collected details of a foiled attack. These reports also detailed the fact that enslaved blacks planned to burn the houses and murder the women before they went on to attack the people at the polls to prevent the secession vote. These reports also documented how these confessions were obtained. Whippings with a lash, every single one of them. In a, later, in a letter dated August 8, 1860, published in the Austin State Gazette the following week, Dentonite S.A. Venters addressed a Confederate major to inform him that the battle in Denton was over. The enemy completely routed out. The abolitionist party defunct. Inventors further promised a hefty majority from Denton County for the pro-slavery Democratic ticket in the upcoming elections. And the secession vote of February 1861 offers clear evidence that union support was high in North Texas, including in Denton County, which only narrowly voted in favor with 331 citizens against 256. Most of the neighboring counties, including Collin, Cook, and Grayson, all voted against joining the Confederacy. Excuse me. So as further evidence of the resistance and the abolitionist sentiment here in North Texas, there was a pretty strong resistance and reaction to the Confederate Conscription Act of uh, April 1862. Um, and this resistance speaks to the brutality of the reactionary and pro-slavery Confederate powers in this region. Uh, at this point, I, I meant to make this announcement earlier, and I'll probably make a few reminders throughout. If you have small children here today, I'd just like to point out that some of the things I'm going to be talking about are, are pretty traumatic. Um, and in general, everyone here, I should have offered a trigger warning ahead of time, and I apologize that I'm a little behind on that, but I'm going to reiterate it again throughout. But I just want to remind everyone that this is a history of white supremacy, and it is violent, and it is vulgar. And I wish I could tell that history without having to be, uh, repeat some of the vulgar words that I have to, but we've made, we've avoided these histories for white comfort for a long time. And part of sacrificing privilege is being willing to feel uncomfortable. So we have to do that. But I do want to just give that trigger warning now. 
So the act drafted most all able-bodied men in the South to fight for the Confederacy with exemptions for those who held, of course, large quantities of persons in bondage, black persons in bondage. And shortly after the act was passed, 30 men from Gainesville, 30 miles north of here, signed a petition to protest these exemptions, which was sent to the Confederate Congress. The presence of this movement fueled a lot of new rumors of violent abolition, abolitionist uprising in Denton County and surrounding communities. And in response, on September 30th, 1862, when Confederate leaders attempted to summon a militia in the region, open opposition was still heavily in the air. And most, most uh, men blatantly expressed an unwillingness to fight for the Confederate cause. And many were nowhere to be found. I hear a lot of people talking about hardly anybody, any men from Denton County registered. You want to know why? They fled. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. So when that happened, when the Confederate Marshal, the Provost, couldn't rally his troops, he sent out a Marshal all over Denton and, and surrounding areas in the anti-secession voting counties. He sent out James G. Borland, who was a plantation over owner who actively imported and exported black human beings across North Texas. He sent them out to find these men who wouldn't muster, along with a troop of state police on a mass manhunt. And while many men did manage to escape, at least 150 from four counties, uh, including Denton, were arrested and charged with treason and conspiracy. Borland and Confederate Colonel William C. Young, who participated in slavery as well, organized a 12-person citizen court to oversee the fates of their captives. With seven additional plantation owners added to the panel, the decision was made to convict by majority versus consensus. After an initial round of trials, the impromptu jury found seven men guilty of being leading unionists, and they were all hung immediately. Unsatisfied with the small number of men hung, a mob of Confederate soldiers hung another 14 men without trial. A week following these hangings, Colonel Young and another Confederate were assassinated by unknown assailants, which sparked renewed calls for unionist blood. Many of the persons already exonerated in the first round of trials were then brought back before the biased jury, which was then overseen by Borland and the deceased Confederate colonel's son, Captain Jim Young. Nineteen more men were convicted and hung as traitors to the Confederate cause. Word of these events obviously spread pretty quickly across the region, and as the threat of treason became paramount, by mid-October, five men were hung in Sherman, Another five men were hung in Decatur, and at least one man was shot right here on the Denton Square for his Unionist sentiments. By the end of the Civil War, only 233 men registered into Confederate forces with addresses from Denton County. At least 102 made their way north to voluntarily fight for the Union. We don't have a monument to those men who left their families and fled north to voluntarily fight with the Union and against slavery. We don't memorialize those men on our county courthouse lawns, do we? Now, local officials would tell you, but we have an all-war memorial. They're included too. What are their names? Where are they included in Denton County's history? On the Office of Cultural Affairs and History website, they're not. So as the Civil War approached its end, the daily reports from the front lines flooded into Denton, and with each update on the Union Army's progress, local anxieties flared again. Confederate veteran Boone Dougherty and his two brothers owned property a mile north of Denton on Locust Street. This property is on what is now Texas Women's University, what used to be known as the College of Industrial Arts. Uh, it's, it's not, there it wasn't the college yet, but it would become that later. But it was a plantation owned by the Dougherty family at the time. And so Mrs. T.W. Dougherty was living on the property there at the plantation during the war along with two other women, Mrs. D.H. Fry and Mrs. Burris. And one afternoon in the spring of 1864, a black man named Nelson, enslaved by the Dougherty family, 
was accused of sassing one of the women in the house. Later that same evening, word of his insolence spread across town and it was reported that a band of citizens abducted him from his quarters behind the Dougherty home. And the next morning, another black enslaved woman found him hanging from a tree on the Dougherty property. According to Boone Dougherty, this wasn't any tree. It was selected for its particular abundance of low limbs, which would offer enough space, as he put it, to swing half a dozen other offenders at once. And he made sure to point this out to the remaining enslaved persons on his, on his farm. He thought it was a rather ingenious plan. And while this story of Nelson's lynching is horrific in its own right, his tragic end, as recounted by his own white master, offers an insightful revelation regarding the enslaved population in Denton County at the time. And I'll tell you why. Many decades later, Boone Dougherty, as he's boasting of this lynching in a news article, 40 years later, in which he reported there were multiple enslaved persons on his property, which he aimed to intimidate in 1864, so many that it required multiple quarters behind the main house. Yet, on the 1860 federal schedules, the Dougherty's claimed only two persons were held in bondage on their property. None of the surnames of the other women living in that home identified on the farm are listed on the schedule, and Miss Dougherty would not have been able or inclined to enslave more persons while her husband was at war. So the easiest explanation for this discrepancy is that Dougherty claimed possession, claimed possession of far fewer enslaved persons than were actually held bondage on his farm in order to reduce his taxes. So while this discrepancy remains an isolated recovery in my uh, an isolated discovery in my research, it does suggest that the enslaved population of Denton County may have been much higher than actually reported by white people who enslaved them. So if anybody out here is a history major or interested in taking on a history project, I highly encourage you to start researching the 1850 and 1860 census. They'll tell you that there is no 1860 slave schedule for Denton County. That's not true. I found it. If you'd like to see it, just send me an email and I will send you a link. You have to work hard to get it. I did the work. It's there. So while the anti-Confederate sentiment was high in this region leading up to the war and the years immediately after the Civil War, let it be clarified that neo-Confederates unarguably retained their dominance over Denton communities as prominent political and cultural influencers. After fighting for the Confederate Army for three years, former Denton County Sheriff C.A. Williams, Charles Alexander Williams, who according to the recollections of his own family, was an unapologetically and completely unreconstructed Southerner was re-elected in 1866. Shortly thereafter, Congress issued its first Reconstruction Act, which divided the South into federally super supervised military districts and removed a swath of Texas officials deemed and as an impediment to Reconstruction. Denton businessman and Confederate State Senator J.M. Blount was one of those included in the first federal cleanse of Texas's post-war legislation or Texas's post-war legislature. Corruption at the county levels in Denton, however, where Confederate veterans and their sympathizers retained status and power remained highly corrupt. In the autumn of 1867, federal officials enacted additional vast scale ousters that targeted local level Texas officials who refused to protect the rights of newly freed black persons. Among them was Denton County Sheriff C.A. Williams though he was merely one of many local officials who opposed Reconstruction efforts and was sympathetic to the Confederate cause. Time out. Overheating phones, it's a sad story. So around the same time Williams was removed, the district judge at Denton refused to hear a case against a local Confederate veteran who sabotaged a federal military telegraph line routed through the area, which ultimately he was set free without a trial. The South may have lost the Civil War, but the Confederacy still reigned victorious in Denton County, and unsurprisingly, pro-Confederate culture still thrived. 
The city's first newspaper, The Denton Review, was launched by Confederate veteran James P. Bates, son of early Denton pioneer Willis H. Bates, and nephew of Zion Methodist Reverend William E. Bates. It's okay. It's okay. I need water. Okay. There's water over there. There's no water. Okay. From 1864 until the mid-1870s, the paper published regular editorials that boldly opposed radical reconstruction reform. Radical reconstruction reform. The second newspaper to arrive in Denton County after the war was the Denton Monitor, which hit stands in 1868 with weekly espousals of pro-Confederate and anti-construction anti-reconstruction rhetoric, which for 40 years thereafter served as the sole primary form of news for the local community. That was it. Confederate news for everyone. The man behind the ink at the Denton Monitor was Confederate veteran Charles W. Greer, who was well known for his political affiliations with leading state Democrats, and he used the local publication to protest fervently in favor of the Southern white man's cause and against federal reconstruction. Similar to Bates, Greer was also connected to early Protestant movements in Denton. The same year he launched the Denton Monitor, Greer helped establish Denton's first Christian church as a charter member. In his editorials, Greer made regular appeals to Dentonites for high morality and up. Hey. What church? Uh, the first Christian church. Denton's first Christian church. Denton's first Christian church. That's Yeah. the tree over there and see if there's a megaphone I could borrow. There might be a megaphone under one of those trees. I could just keep going with that. Did you lose all power? Yes. against freed black persons 
which was matched with an overall rise in vigilante justice in the region. In early March 1869, a white woman named Sarah Newland of Denton reported that she had been sexually assaulted in a prairie by a black man named George Crawford. At this moment, I would like to offer another trigger warning to anyone in attendance that I will be discussing details of sexual assault and murder. In response to these accusations by Sarah Newland, local citizens immediately accosted Crawford, who narrowly managed to escape, but two weeks later was recaptured, chained to a horse, and drugged to jail, where he was held briefly before he was then turned over to local citizens for vigilante punishment. Upon his arrival into the city of Denton on the square, Crawford was chained to a street post right here on the southeast courthouse lawn as a large mob of white citizens gathered to scream threats and insults at the accused man. And as onlookers demanded he be lashed and burnt at the post, Crawford still insisted his innocence and refused to admit to an assault he didn't commit. In response, he was left chained to the post throughout the day where passerbyers could continue to assault him. Later that evening, later that evening, later that evening, officials relocated Crawford to his accuser's kitchen where he was tortured until the early morning hours and forced to confess to the rape that he didn't commit. Mrs. Newland herself was afforded the opportunity to shoot him dead. Locals who reported this incident to outside publications went out of their way to make sure to emphasize how Crawford suffered a great deal before his death. And they applauded the actions of local Dentonites. They applauded the actions of local Dentonites. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. And so this story represents a moment where a black man was criminalized simply for being in the same space as a white woman. He was immediately, he, he never, he wasn't even dehumanized. He was never even given the opportunity to be seen as human. And the rallying cry of white citizens was his torture. This was white godliness in Denton in 1869. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Does it still show the Denton monitor? In the fall following the murder of George Crawford, another black man named, George, named Charles was shot and killed just 25 miles west of town for calling a white man a liar in public. Similar incidents like this of vigilante justice increased in frequency and viciousness throughout Denton County in the early years after the war, as this sort of complete disregard for the Reformation laws and an unwavering dedication to white supremacist ideals was commonplace among the white elite. Prominent white citizens often referred to freed black persons in their publications by their former auction values. They mocked their pursuits of suffrage and equality with disdain, and they violently opposed their access to public education. As federal reconstruction efforts waned in the South by the mid-1870s, black Denton County children were still without access to school. With at least 25 school-aged children in need, local advocates in the black community petitioned the county to provide them with opportunity. And Judge C.C. Scruggs ordered the formation of colored school number 17 with the appointment of three black trustees from the local community, one of whom was named Sterling Johnson. He was 41 years old at the time of his trustee appointment. He was brought to Texas from Mississippi in 1858 by his former master and eventually to Denton County shortly before the war. 
When voter registration opened up in 1861, Sterling Johnson was the third name on the roster and subsequently the first black man in Denton County to ever register to vote. Shortly after Johnson arrived in Texas, he met his wife Emily, who was born into slavery in Kentucky. At 12 years old, Emily was raped by her white master, which resulted in the birth of her daughter, Adeline. By 1870, Sterling and Emily were married and young Adeline had adopted Johnson's last name. Johnson became a federally appointed reconstruction official in Denton County and was likely the instigator for the free public school petition that was submitted on behalf of black children in the region. Yet less than two weeks after Judge Skuggs ordered the formation of colored school number 17 in October of 1876, Johnson and the two other black appointees were all stripped of their trustee positions without any explanation in the official records. The men were subsequently re replaced by three prominent white men, John N. McNeil, William H. Mounts, and Confederate veteran Philip Minor. In recollections later published by the federally ousted Denton County Sheriff C.A. Williams, the local Ku Klux Klan organization was thoroughly unnerved by Johnson's appointee and activism within the county, and as a result, the first, reconstruct, the first order of Ku Klux Klan attacked and whipped Johnson to such an egregious degree that years later he remained completely crippled and ultimately died from his injuries. Another of the trustees, originally appointed, completely disappeared from public record. It was another two years in August 1878 before local black resident Anthony Hembry took up the school campaign again with a second petition to Judge Scruggs, which was approved. The school was reauthorized 13 years after the end of the Civil War, eight years after the Freedmen's Bureau concluded reconstruction efforts in Texas, and two years after Sterling Johnson was maimed and ultimately murdered by the Ku Klux Klan for his efforts, finally black children in Denton had their own school. But the school's establishment did not create instant access to education. As late as 1880, many black children continued to serve in white homes for pay that was beyond meager, if at all, and they endured highly abusive environments wrought with suspicion and accusation. More than 15 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, prominent white Denton physician Henry Owsley and his wife Louisiana held two black children in bondage as servants in their home in Denton. A young black child named Alice Chin was similarly held in bondage well into the 1880s as a slave on the homestead of Joseph Welty Jr., farmer and son of Denton County Confederate veteran John C. Welty. Denton County farmer Oliver Bonner held 14-year-old Mealy Bonner as a slave in his home well into the 1880s. Born in 1873, several years after emancipation, seven-year-old Emmeline Baggett was trafficked into Denton County and enslaved as a servant in the home of Denton farmer Samuel Hunter and his wife Mary as a dressing maid. Nine-year-old Anne Blount was enslaved and lived in the home of Confederate veteran and lawyer Phineas Ewing Piner and his wife Henrietta. Born in 1861 at the start of the war, Anne was given the surname of Confederate State Senator J.M. Blount, who was federally removed from office in Texas for his post-war obstructionist efforts. It is a safe assumption that Blount maintained possession of Anne's mother. And when Anne's mother gave birth to her, that child was taken and sold to another white family in Denton, years after emancipation. Baptist preacher Silas G. Cristal enslaved nine-year-old Mandy in his Denton home until at least 1870. 
As one of few Denton residents who practiced slavery in 1860 before the war, Silas's father held Mandy's parents in bondage before the emancipation. Born more than a decade after emancipation, six-year-old Dolly Walden was enslaved in the home of Denton Mayor and Confederate veteran Calvin L. Herbert as late as 1880. These are just a few of the names that I know. And these are just the names that I found because I looked. Any historian could have found them. As a matter of fact, I found them because other historians did. They just didn't publish the truth, the whole truth. Confined to the homes of their post-war masters, these black children were enslaved in Denton County homes in which white children also lived and were allowed to attend school. But census records show that these, children's listed as, these children listed as servants were denied access to, to the school created just for them. And as a result, all of them were illiterate. None of these children can be accounted for in any U.S. Census data in any county in any state beyond 1880. They all simply disappear. So nearly half a century after the Zion congregation established themselves as the leading figures in local religion and politics, they became the leading figures in a pro-Confederate collective of white elites who wanted to build an ultra-moral community for themselves, focused on white progress, building a white cosmopolis that had no room for free blacks in it. And as Denton County approached nearly half a century of growth, this white body politic sought to reaffirm itself among other North Texas communities, employing assorted historical memories underscored by a universal theomythology of whiteness and whiteness's perfection, Denton's elite celebrated their dominance over indigenous and emancipated black communities of color. And these local commemorations were established to build counter historical narratives that both minimized the atrocities committed in the past and perpetuated white progress at the continued expense of marginalized non-white communities. Sustaining this theo-mythical legend of whiteness's power became one of the most important socio-civic endeavors in Denton County after the turn of the 20th century. So nearly 60 years after John B. Denton's death, John B. Denton was already thoroughly mythologized within Denton's white community as a murdered minister patriot who defended early settlers against the ravages of Indians. The city, county, a local creek, a high school, a small college were all afforded his namesake. During the summer of 1900, the county's old settlers association, largely comprised of Confederate veterans, decided to locate Denton's remains for an entombment and memorialization on the county courthouse lawn right here at the center of Denton. They appointed a committee of Confederates to oversee a search for Denton's body and Confederate veteran Reverend William Allen compiled a historical account entitled The Life and Times of Captain John B. Denton. Citing more legend than evidence, his historical asserts that Denton's body was first buried on the banks of Oliver Creek shortly after he was killed in the attack, until later exhumed by pioneer John Chisholm, who supposedly reburied Denton at his ranch. Then, in 1900, Denton's body was supposedly unearthed for a second time and relocated for his final and third burial on the county courthouse lawn. And if you're not aware, you can turn around behind you. His tombstone is right there. And here on the screen, there's a photo of the large crowd gathered for his supposed burial. On November 21st, 1901, the Methodist militant minister, John P. Denton, was officially memorialized as a hero by Denton's white community for his voluntary participation in the massacre of Village Creek indigenous tribes half a century prior. 
Local citizens filled every floor of the county courthouse for the massive public ceremony in honor of a man who was simultaneously endeared as a great revivalist of the Methodist Church. Denton's supposed remains, as I said, are buried right here on the courthouse lawn. The tombstone erected there notes his sacrifice for the public good. As a man who fought valiantly against the wild tribes of Indians that infested the Texas frontier. There's very little in the way of archivable history for Captain Denton. Most of the accounts of his acts are highly romanticized, over-flourished um, legends. And they continue to be promoted as history on local county websites. They continue to espouse these false legends as actual history. You can go look at them today. But one thing they like to leave out is that the University of Texas a few years ago was out here when they were excavating the, the redoing the courthouse lawn and they, they had to excavate the bones. So some University of Texas researchers took some DNA samples and guess who's buried there? A pig. <laughs> They're pig bones. It's not even a real burial. So the historical designation on this county courthouse lawn, which is largely based on that uh, fake burial, uh -huh. also protects this monument. Lies, falsehoods to protect false white histories that are more legend than fact. So even though Denton was an aggressor in an unprovoked attack on an autonomous settlement of indigenous people, who traveled more than 50 miles away to participate. Denton wasn't under attack. He left here and traveled 50 miles away on a horse to slaughter indigenous tribes. Our city and our county still bear his namesake. And his commemoration was the first of several that set the tone for the 20th century wherein white men would be repeatedly valorized for violent acts committed against non-whites. During the summer of 1905, shortly after the Girls College of Industrial Arts, now known as Texas Women's University, was established here in Denton, a woman named Katie Daffin came to teach. Daffin was the daughter of notorious South Texas Reconstruction Klansman Lawrence Daffin. And Katie Daffin went on to organize Denton's UDC, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Right there is where it was established in that county courthouse the same summer, 1905, and the chapter was named in her honor. The Katie Daffin UDC's chapter's earliest activities were immediately focused on redeeming a dying Confederate vision in Denton. In 1909, UDC leaders convinced the school board to rename all of Denton's public schools after Confederate military heroes. The Central School became the Robert E. Lee School, the North Ward became the Stonewall Jackson, and the West Ward became Sam Houston. Don't let anyone tell you that they started that way. They were renamed. It was an intentional effort to spread falsehood and false history and valorize criminals as heroes. In the summer of 1910, Mrs. Daffin visited the local UDC leaders to remind them of the local chapter's true purpose, according to her speech. And shortly thereafter, Denton's daughters announced plans to erect a large monument to the Confederacy. That's what they called it. Not a monument to soldiers, a monument to the Confederacy, quote unquote. And this move set the stage again for the next decade wherein the UDC would continue to reshape white and black relations within a distinctly racialized narrative in Denton. In December of 1911, the Southern Amusement Company produced a stage play of Thomas Dixon's novel, The Klansman, at the Wright Opera House on Denton's downtown square. Now it's recycled books. Built by Confederate veteran W.C. Wright, who had died a few years earlier, the Opera House was under the purview of Wright's widow. UDC member Mrs. Julia Wright and her son Crow. Julia was also the daughter of John W. Gover, one of few Denton County white men who engaged in slavery before the war. 
In this respect, the White Opera House was a prime location for the racialized lost cause mythology promoted by the Klansman novel, which simultaneously afforded a heroic memorialization for the first generation Ku Klux Klan. But the year of 1913 was pivotal for the white revisionist efforts underway in Denton. After a black man referred to as Uncle Shepherd Middleton died in the summer of 1913, he was heralded by the local white press as a fine old type of antebellum Negro and commemorated as a gentleman of his color whose humble type was rapidly disappearing. He was her heralded as the former property of the Gano family, and his contribution to the Confederate cause was highlighted as he served as a body servant, their words, for his young master, General Richard M. Gano, all of which was highlighted in detail. He was forced to stand in front of a white man who hid behind his body while he fired shots at the Union. That's what a body servant is. He was forced to dig pits for his white master to defecate in. That's what a body servant is. He was forced to cook the meals of his white master. That's what a body servant is. The Confederacy did not allow black men to join the army. As a matter of fact, they instituted several resolutions stating that if at any time black men were allowed to join the army, their cause would be for naught. So the next time you see some Confederate veteran organization or UDC organization or someone trying to tell you that black people served in the Civil War, well, you could probably put a gun to my head and make me do a lot of things, too. So a few days after Shepard Middleton was highlighted in the press, as a reminder to local black citizens of the type of blacks white Dentonites wanted in their community. Colored School number 17, which Sterling Johnson was killed for earlier in the decade, was burned to the ground. No details regarding the cause of the fire were ever published, but its mysterious destruction implied a clear message. White Denton wanted more Uncle Shepherds, not Sterling Johnson's and affording black children equal access to education was not conducive to that effort. Therefore, they would not have it. Around the same time, the local UDC kicked off their annual term with a $5,000 contract for a county tribute to the Confederacy. And that October, the chapter announced its plans to raise these funds by the subsequent fall. So let me reiterate that. Their original contract was for $5,000 in 1913, and it was their plan to raise those funds in one year by county subscription. And at the same time that these monument fundraising efforts are kicked off, Denton City Federation of Women's Club was formed. And this is a conglomerate organization of appointed representatives from Denton's assorted white women's club. So the city federation facilitated a formative body where elite white women could rally their resources to work together in their common goals and endeavors. And though Denton's UDC was not initially a delegated club in the city federation, nearly half of the delegates assigned at its formation were UDC members who were just appointed via their memberships in other clubs. So with these delegates in place, the UDC facilitated significant influence over city federation agendas and activities from the time of the organization's inception. By May of 1914, the city federation published its first public bulletin with a civic recommendation from CIA College of Industrial Arts professor C.N. Atkinson, whose wife was the city federation secretary and whose daughter was a UDC member. And his suggestion went as followed. Why not make a public park, an athletic field, out of that district, just north of the business section known as Quakertown. As my good friend and colleague Chelsea Stallings is gonna explain here in just a little bit in much greater detail, Quakertown was the all black neighborhood and business district once located just south of the CIA 
until Denton civic and business leaders joined in this collective white front during the 1920s to forcibly remove the community using the strong arm of the new second generation Ku Klux Klan organization that they bring into place. But the campaign started in 1914. At the same time, the fundraising monument began, or the, the fundraising efforts for the monument began. They were two efforts hand in hand. Erect a monument to white supremacy, to Confederate soldiers, which in their minds were the same as the Ku Klux Klan, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit more, but I wanna make sure everyone understands that connection. The campaign to remove Quakertown and the fundraising campaign to build that monument were started at the same time by the same people. So before we can get into the evolution of Denton's second generation Klan during the 20s, we have to first understand Denton's Ku Klux Klan movement and how it functioned as a seamless theopolitical ideology that began during the Reconstruction era, era and carried forward into the early 20th century. So assessing their organizational publications and activities, Denton County Confederate Veterans Organizations and their affiliate, the UDC, um, they collective, you can see, they collectively valorized Confederate soldiers for their post-war vigilante activities as much, if not more, than their actual wartime efforts. And their distinct brand of post-war Ku Klux Confederate heroism was part of an ongoing trend that began with the establishment of Denton County itself, wherein white men, again, were repeatedly valorized for their violent dominations of indigenous peoples and black people in particular, but all populations of color for the sake of white prosperity. Directed by the efforts of these post-war white heritage organizations determined to preserve the racial hierarchy of the Old South, the Confederacy's lost cause narrative evolved in the early 20th century to serve as an enduring symbol of white supremacy's divine mandate. Collectively, the white supremacist teachings of the local UDC heroized Confederate veterans as Klansmen redeemers of the white race which facilitated the rapid development of Denton's second generation Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. We know this because the local UDC studied their own organizational texts and they published updates in the paper regularly about what texts they were reading. And we can read those texts and we can see the knowledge that they were absorbing and disseminating. And these texts very clearly heroize Confederate veterans and identify them as the first generation Ku Klux Klan. These figures were one in the same. Wrongs of History Righted is a pseudo scholarly text written by UDC historian General Mildred Lewis Rutherford. The 40 page work claims to offer a true history of the war between the states and was presented for critical examination at the National UDC Convention in 1914. According to UDC historian General Rutherford, um, slavery played no role at all in the events that led to the Confederacy's rebellion against the United States. Rutherford taught Denton's daughters that slavery was no disgrace to the owner or the owned because those persons who were brought from Africa were initially savage to the last degree. And their reform under rigid law was a strong argument for the civilizing power of slavery. Citing Genesis 17, Rutherford taught UDC members that God gave to Abraham the most explicit directions on how to enslave black persons. And she looked to the New Testament for justification as well with citations from Matthews 8 to argue that Jesus also favored slavery without rejection. Referencing Titus 2, Rutherford used Pauline gospel to claim that persons of color and black persons in particular were ordered to be obedient to whites as their benefactors. She argued that Ephesians 6, 5 through 8 supported slavery as a noble institution directly. Rutherford's take on theological white supremacy and the Christian nature of, of slavery cannot be overemphasized. This was UDC ideology. Here's what UDC 
members in Denton Red were taught and they taught themselves. Slaveholders had part in the greatest missionary and educational endeavors that the world has ever known. In all the history of the world, no peasantry was ever better cared for, more contented or happier. This was how the UDC taught lessons of slavery. Rutherford also stressed the modern implications of her history and she encouraged the local chapters to engage thoroughly with their organizational mission by stressing certain standards within their own respective communities. She said, the Negro race should give thanks daily that they and their children are not today where their ancestors were before they came into bondage. These wrongs must be righted and the southern slaveholder defended as soon as possible. While the Negro under the present system of education may know more Latin and Greek, it does not better fit him for his life's work. At the close of her textbook, Rutherford further connected the perpetuation of these ideals with justice to the living memory of the dead. And Denton's UDC wasted no time heeding her call. In January of 1916, several UDC members visited the city's white public schools in honor of Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee's birthday. As they presented to the local children, historicals that represented this man as the most beloved of the Southern Confederates. And as the UDC women two and a half years later struggled to raise funds for their stagnant monument fund, which again, two years later was only at $350 after almost three years of efforts, really. And they had to reduce their monument contract from 5,000 to 2,000 because of the lack of support. The women used the opportunity of Lee's birthday to encourage children to petition their parents for contributions. They sent letters to all the white schools in the city to announce the monument would include special drinking fountains dedicated to the children of Denton. Around the same time, a new school called the Frederick Douglass School for Children of Color was built. They didn't send a letter to that school because the fountains on the Confederate monument were never meant for those children. Black children weren't allowed to come on the square. They certainly wouldn't be allowed to drink from the Confederate monument fountains. By January 1917, Denton's UDC was still under pressure to meet their $2,000 goal before the monument contract expired. And by this time, the organization had only raised just shy of $1,200, of which more than $300 was still outstanding. The monument fundraiser's ultimate success was achieved with a special two-night screening in January 1917 at the CIA Birth of a Nation screening. The Birth of a Nation is a film production of Thomas Dixon's The Klansman, which is now notoriously associated with the rise of the 1920s second generation Ku Klux Klan movement, particularly within Texas. So they showed a Klan film, charged for tickets, and that money helped build a monument to the Confederacy. A monument to Klansmen because in the mind of UDC members, first-generation Klansmen and Confederate veterans were one and the same. Shortly after the film, W.C. Edwards, editor of the local Denton Record Chronicle and husband of the UDC Monument Committee's publicity secretary, published a rave review of the film in the local paper. He said, the affections of the great crowd that cheered the Confederacy, Dixie, the Ku Klux Klan and the ascendancy of the Anglo-Saxon race over Negroes. The southern white soldiers preferring death and dishonor rose in the organization of the Ku Klux Klan, which restores the order which God Almighty intended. In September 1917, as Denton's daughters approached the end of their monument campaign, they made an announcement in the local paper that they had begun studying another of their official UD texts, also written by the organization's historian general, Margaret Rutherford, called Historical Sins of Omission and Commission. Largely focused on the Reconstruction era, this text is 
a compilation of disparate articles and quotes largely from anonymous authors and unverified sources with Rutherford's commentary dispersed throughout. And here's what Rutherford had to say. The North said the Freedmen's Bureau was necessary to protect the Negro. The South said the Ku Klux Klan was necessary to protect the white woman. The trouble arose from the inf interference on the part of scalawags and carpetbaggers, and they were the ones to be dealt with first to keep the Negroes in their rightful place. Mrs. Rose's Ku Klux Klan book is an authority on this subject. Put that book into your schools. Denton's chapter was definitely familiar with the work of their former historian general, Mrs. Rose, and her book, The Ku Klux Klan or Invisible Empire, which they endorsed unanimously at their annual conference just a few years earlier, along with a pledge to place it in Denton's schools as a supplementary reader for history. You can read it for yourself if you'd like to know what they had to say. The Sons of Confederate Veterans also unanimously endorsed the book and promoted its distribution in their own magazine. So for anyone to say that the words in this book don't represent the thoughts of the Confederate Veterans or the UDC at the time, they're not reading the book because both organizations unanimously endorsed its comment, its, uh, its words and its teachings. And it is perhaps one of the most explicit of the UDC's primary texts. The book is an emphatic ode to white supremacy. It is a written memorial to Ku Klux Confederate veterans. Rose's opening dedication alone affords a stark glimpse into the world of UDC mythology that dominated during the early 1900s in which Confederate veterans and first generation Klansmen were indistinguishable soldiers of valor. She dedicates her book to the youth of the Southland, hoping that a perusal of its pages will inspire them with respect and admiration for the Confederate soldiers who were the real Ku Klux and whose deeds of deeds of courage and valor have never been surpassed. Reading like excerpts from Dixon's The Klansman, Rose's history praised the Confederate soldiers who thrilled the world with their deeds of courage and valor during a long and noble war. And she staged the Confederates' plight and suffering not within battle, but rather upon their return to desolated homes where they were forced to confront the most horrifying war penalties of slave confiscation and Reconstruction under African rule. According to Rose, the Reconstruction era in the South was apocalyptic chaos, a once civilized white supremacist society under total attack. And the most terrifying threats were black freed persons who considered their freedom synonymous with equality. A concept so menacing it required the response of a powerful secret order, as she puts it. And she explains how Confederate soldiers, as members of the Ku Klux Klan, might have lost the war but still rescued the South from a bondage worse than death. Shortly after finishing this text on June 3rd, 1918, on the birthday of their Confederate hero, Jefferson Davis, Denton's Katie Daffin UDC and City Federation of Women's Club dedicated this Confederate monument at the center of Denton Square. The monument features two columns with water fountains that were set low for the county's white children as promised, which together support an arch adorned by a sculpture of a generic Confederate cadet. You'll notice there are no names of soldiers affixed to or recognized by the monument, though each column does bear an inscription. The inscription on the right is an altered excerpt from Alfred Allison Lord Tennyson in a poem he wrote entitled, entitled Theresius. In Historical Sins of Omission and Commission, UDC historian Mil Mil Mildred Rutherford notes that Tennyson was an intimate friend of Southern writers. And a thorough analysis of Tennyson's Theresius offers insight into the white supremacist affinity for Tennyson's work among the UDC members. Based on Greek mythos, Tennyson's poem memorializes a battle detailed in the play Seven Against Thebes, set in the reign of Oedipus 
Tiresias was a blind Theban soothsayer and servant to Menesius, the son of Creon, and descendant of the valiant Spartan race. Inspired by Tiresias' prophecy, which foretold of a Spartan who would perish to spare Thebes from destruction, Menesius jumped to his death from the city walls when hostile forces later laid siege to the city, ultimately sparing Thebes and saving the society. So this poem speaks directly to lost cause mythology because it frames Tiresias' personal sacrifice for the state as the noblest form of death. In, Tiresias's poem, or in, Tennyson's, in Tennyson's poem, Tiresias tells Menesius, the man who jumps to his death to save the Spartan race, he tells him, my son, no sound is breathed so potent to coerce and to conciliate as their names who dare for that sweet motherland which gave them birth, nobly to do, nobly to die, their names graven on memorial columns are a song heard far in the future. Few but more than wall and rampart, their example reach a hand far through all the years and everywhere they meet and kindle generous purpose and strength to mold it into actions as pure as theirs. That's the excerpt on that column over there. So these words are more than just comfort pining for lost cause mythical memories. These words served and were meant to impart strength to the faltering, to fire the ambition of a white brave man. Collectively, they offered a framework for neo-Confederates who sought to commemorate their misdeeds as honorable. Their names commemorated as an eternal song, their deeds engraved immortal, they could serve as both monument and example. Similar excerpts from Tennyson's poem are found on Confederate monuments erected across the South, many of which look exactly like this. These aren't pieces of art, they're mass-produced lawn ornaments. You can find a monument that looks just like this 30 miles north, they are nothing special. Most notably, the monument erected by Georgia UDC chapter on Shiloh Battlefield a year prior to the one in Denton has the exact same excerpt. And Confederate Veteran Magazine article which detailed the Shiloh Monument's unveiling in which Confederate veterans themselves clarified the inferred connotation of the poetic excerpts were meant to serve as an inspiration for every man and southern boy, obligated by his own immediate contact with and knowledge of heroism and southern examples of patriotism. The Denton Record Chronicle similarly reported details of Denton's monument unveiling under a grand headline that read, Commemoration of Confederate Deeds. Commemoration of Confederate Deeds, not soldiers. Deeds. Well, what did they do? A Confederate veteran spoke at the monument ceremony on the unveiling here in Denton, and he expressed his deep satisfaction that children of coming generations would be proud to hear the story of the Confederacy as related by the monument. The event itself was moral, memorialized in the DRC as a day long to be remembered by lovers of the Old South and its people. A day of commemoration of past events and inspiration for future events. The monument's inscription and presence helped inspire an unknown, unknown number of whites who soon became the next generation of Ku Klux heroes. Just days after the unveiling ceremony, Denton's UDC offered a full account of their monument fund in the DRC. My comprehensive analysis of these monument contributors, their activities within Denton's community, their businesses, fraternal, familial relations, exposes an undeniable intimacy between three particular phenomena within Denton's history. One, the installment of this Confederate monument at the center of town. Two, the terrorization and eradication of Quakertown residents, black residents from within the inner city. And three, the rise of the area's second generation Ku Klux Klan, clavern number 136.
I know you're just sitting, but drink water. It's hot. It's good for you. There's a medic here who has implored me to say that over and over again. So Denton's daughters reported that they raised $2,042, of which they attributed $720 to various fundraisers held over the course of their eight-year funding campaign. So again, I want to clarify. They claim they raised $2,042, and 720 of that was allocated to various fundraisers. The rest of it can be accounted for by name and dollar of independent contributors. But the only fundraiser event that the daughters ever directly acknowledged as correlated with the monument were pretty unsuccessful tag days, the last of which only raised $115 with the monument fund, still hundreds and hundreds of dollars from its goal. This considered the large $720 sum attributed to UDC tag days must have at least in part been raised at the 1917 screening of the Klan film, Birth of a Nation. A further examination of UDC accounting reveals that $1,322, or 65% of the total cost of the monument, was contributed by the 144 individual subscriptions, which ranged between $1 and $100 each. Now, accounting for inflation, the total $2,042 reportedly raised by the UDC equates to a modern value of just under $34,000. A $1 donation in 1918 was the equivalent of a modest but notable 16 today. Five was rather generous, uh, a modern value of about 83. Starting around $10 were considered high donors, giving a modern equivalence of no less than 166. And a few gave 15, an approximate $250 value today. Some gave as much as $25, the modern equivalent of $636. A substantial portion of individual contributions came from UDC members themselves and their families, who collectively accounted for 22% of those 144 individual contributors and 29% of the $1,322 raised by individual subscription. As a testament to the monument's Confederate values of white supremacy and their connection to the commemoration of past events, at least 70 of the 144 individual donors, or 49% of the people who donated to the monument were direct descendants of members of families who practiced slavery between 1800 and 1860. Collectively, these 70 descendants contributed $857, 65% of the individual subscriptions. Of those, 65 were less than two generations removed from households that held black people in bondage. Seven of those 65 were from Denton County families who enslaved at least 28 persons right here before the war. Now, at least 89 white families in Denton County enslaved no less than 253 persons of color, black persons, in 1860, which means that less than 2% of the Denton County population practiced slavery, compared to 28% of Texas households at large. Yet, nearly half of the, those who contributed to this monument descended from households that practiced slavery. This preponderance speaks directly to the invested interests of those who supported this tribute, as well as the ideals of the women who erected it. Thus far, I have identified 515 black enslaved persons connected to the families that paid for this Confederate monument, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge their efforts because the labor of those enslaved black persons afforded those families the money that was used to pay for that monument. Isn't that despicable? And those are just the, those are just the enslaved persons I'm able to identify. 515 lives. Just in 1860, just the ones I was able to find. How many enslaved black persons paid for this monument with forced labor. I don't see that on the plaque over there. I don't see it on the Denton County Office of History and Culture's website. These facts seem to be missing. As made clear by the commemorative inscription, this monument was erected at the center of Denton just to memorial, or was not erected at the center of Denton just to memorialize the past. This monument was meant to inspire a very particular future, and it did. 
at least 42 persons or 30% of the 144 individual monument contributors either themselves were involved or were later involved with Quaker Town's forced removal or they were the immediate family members of someone who was. A majority of the largest contributions came from those who expressed explicit anti-Quaker Town sentiments. A total of $697, or 53% of the total 1322 attributed to individual donors. Additionally, of the 144 individual contributors identified, at least 30 of them, or 20%, were either themselves connected to or were the immediate family members of individuals I have been able to verify as connected to or as part of Denton's Ku Klux Klan activity, which exploded across the county shortly after the monument's establishment. Collectively, Klan contributions totaled $477, 35% of the total of individual contributions attributed Keep in mind, the Ku Klux Klan is a secret organization. I didn't have a member log to work on. These are just the members I've been able to identify thus far. And don't worry, I'm not done. Because we're gonna have all of them. If we're gonna be proud of our past, let's be proud of our past. Because I hate to tell you, some of those last names are gonna sound real familiar. No surprise. And they still hold a lot of power right now in our community. So while it took Denton's UDC chapter eight years to erect their Confederate tribute, the events inspired by their efforts thereafter unfolded rather quickly. Already largely in control of the city federation via delegate appointments through other club memberships, the UDC was officially federated the following fall. A year and a half later, in December 1920, the UDC and City Federation officially partnered with Denton's Chamber of Commerce and Rotary Club in a public campaign to forcibly remove Denton's primary com black community out of their inner city Quakertown neighborhood, which they replaced with a whites-only park. While many white elites conspired to accomplish this city cleansing, no group was given more credit or claimed more responsibility for the campaign's success than the City Federation, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. It wasn't a secret. Everyone knows. They brag about it in their own texts. This was their doing. They inspired this movement. Armed with their new suffrage rights and a list of ready subscribers that they'd already collected via their Confederate monument campaign, these women conducted extensive door-to-door -door canvases throughout the city to obtain signatures on a petition calling, calling for Quaker Town's replacement with the whites-only park. The campaigns were synonymous. They were executed in an orderly fashion, just as they were planned. It is clear that Denton's Confederate monument was much more than lost cause pining. It was a culminating testament to white supremacy's reign in Denton's past so as to inspire its perpetual regeneration. It was a response to Quaker Town's increasing self-sufficiency because it threatened neo-Confederate identities that are rooted in white supremacy, largely in theological doctrine. How can whites be ordained superior by God if an entire black community could prosper without white endorsement. The monument guised these insecurities as remembrances for dead soldiers whose supposed sacrifices weren't even honored by name. Together, an elite class of powerful white citizens conglomerated their resources and their privileges to erect a monument to white supremacy. They paid tribute to their ancestors who taught them those ideals, and they worked towards a collective future inspired by them. And that future was led by Denton's second generation Ku Klux Klan. In Denton, myth and memory formed a bridge between the first and second generation clans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy built this bridge of memorial. They carried the torch of Southern Reconstruction myths, which persisted through generations with sentimental value that far outweighed documented history until it eventually replaced reality. 
As the leading historic preservationist during the early 20th century, Denton's UDC had a profound impact on local theohistorical development. They were teachers. They were church leaders. They were regular centerpieces of civic discourse and policy, and they indoctrinated the communities with their lost cause myths. By the time the 1920s Klan order emerged as a national organization, Denton's UDC had been promoting Ku Klux Confederate heroism within the local community for more than a decade. Their mythic history is nothing less than a prophetic conjuring of the second generation's order. The texts studied and taught by Denton's UDC reflected on the Reconstruction era as a demoralized state of affairs that called into existence the Ku Klux Klan, the solution to the dark days. In stark similarity, 1920s Klan membership manual called the Cloran also described the Reconstruction era as an anguish-laden cry of the Southland answered by the gallant knights of the Invisible Empire. UDC, history, UDC histories blamed black persons for Reconstruction Klan violence because they mistook their freedom as synonymous with equality. And they suggested that the freedman's greatest ambition was to sexually exploit a white woman. Similarly, the Cloran revered the Reconstruction Klan for its defense of white women's chastity, and it reduced freedmen to, um, which reduced uh, freedmen to lust crave beasts in human form. It was the same rhetoric, the same language, the UDC suggested that suffrage rights afforded black freedmen after the war led to black heels on white necks, and now we see white knees on black necks. Federal reconstruction efforts in general were called a galling yoke thrust upon the necks of white men. The Cloran used the same exact analogies to describe the reconstruction era. It's the same movement it's the same rhetoric. That is a Ku Klux Klan memorial. By its very definition, by its very design. Not long after this monument was erected, local Ku Klux Klan organizations emerged in communities across North Texas. During the summer of 1922, a meeting was held in the Collin County Courthouse among anti-Klan forces from no, known as the Citizens League. And an account provided from a local sheriff in attendance detailed how local clans had relied on a network of inter-community engagement to ensure that Klan members could remain anonymous. And the sheriff reported how whipping squads were being sent into adjoining communities to cause the worst harm with the minimal possibility of recognition. So if there was a problem in Collin County, Denton clan might come and do whippings there so they couldn't be recognized. If there was a problem here, maybe Fort Worth clan would come and help. But one thing's for certain, Denton's clan was specifically identified in this meeting as a participating element in these whipping squads. By December of 1922, Denton's Klan had successfully facilitated the removal of Quakertown. And at the same time, within two years' time, at least four black men were abducted and removed from the Pilot Point Jail just north of here and lynched on two different occasions. I want to make something very clear. Klan activity in Denton in the 1920s was not only directed by local authorities, it was co coordinated by a network of officials across the city of Denton and the county. An incident reported during the summer of 1923 involving a group of Denton County deputies, including city officer Nick Aiken and Sheriff W.F. Sweeney, adds solid evidence that local authorities directed Klan violence. On their return trip home to Denton from a Klan parade in Gainesville, the officers stopped just north of town in the Sanger community to investigate a tip received at the parade about a gambling house. The officers found the location and they proceeded to raid the home and found dozens of men of assorted races peaceably playing cards. 
Though all of the suspects ran, the officers captured eight men, two white, six black men. Only one black man was shot, or only one man was shot, and he was, of course, black. He was shot three times and died from his injuries. Though it was reported that several white men escaped arrest, subsequent reporting suggests that not all of them escaped punishment. The next day, six robed and hooded Klansmen drug Denton resident Joe Barry out of his home and into his front yard. They tied a handkerchief in his mouth and they flogged him repeatedly with a horsewhip in his front yard. A boarder living with Barry fled from the back of the house and ran right here to the city square where he found city officer Nick Aiken, and he asked for help. Unfortunately, Officer Aiken was just going off duty. Couldn't be of assistance. But Officer Aiken recorded the ongoing assault to another officer, but unfortunately, that officer was also unavailable. The call was ultimately passed on to Sheriff Swinney. Unfortunately, he was sick. Barry never went to the police, nor did they ever seek a statement from him. There was no need. Clan justice had been served. In mid-August 1923, as the last of the black-owned homes were forcibly removed from Quakertown for the new whites-only park site, the local community celebrated with a massive Klan parade throughout our city, right here on this square. In a dramatic show of white victory and power, more than 250 Klan persons paraded our square. The city and county furnished more than 40 special officers to manage over 20,000 onlookers. City officials, including the mayor himself, personally attended and spoke in favor of the Klan. Dozens of police officers themselves marched alongside the Klan in formation and silence. There was no doubt in the minds of anyone living here who ran this town. On January 21st, 1924, Denton Clavern number 136 announced a special meeting in the Denton Record Chronicle for later that evening. And from that point forward, local clan meetings were regularly listed under the Fraternal Lodges section of the paper. Initially, clan announcements were published either the day before or the day of, of the meeting and only included a time, no location. But by August 1925, Denton's clan was meeting every first and third Tuesday. Now, clan recruitment within established fraternal lodges was standard practice during the 1920s. Um, organizations, th this type of organizational in infiltration was not uncommon in North Texas. Several academic studies out of Dallas have shown that at least 84% of the Dallas Klan leadership were also Masons. Research remains to determine the level of association between Denton Masons and Klansmen, but it is evident that the local Denton Klan definitely functioned within the local Odd Fellows and the Woodmen of the World Lodges. Denton Klan meetings were always listed directly under the Odd Fellows Lodge and DRC announcements without a location until 1925 when the order began to list their meeting location as Wow Hall, Woodmen of the World Hall. While the Wow Camp didn't have its own hall, the 1920 city directory shows that the WOW camp met in the Oddfellows Lodge. A historical narrative for Denton's Oddfellows Lodge, number 82, also confirms that the building hosted WOW meetings. After 19, or November 1925, Denton's clan began to regularly advertise its meetings for the same location and time as the Oddfellows Lodge. And that building is a re just across the street. You can still see the old Oddfellows sign above it. That's where Denton's clan met right here on this square. Now, by this time, Klan recruitment was openly occurring. Sure, it was a secret organization, but people didn't have to hide their clannishness. It was something to be celebrated. Clannishness meant patriotism. It was a rebranding of patriotism. 
Visiting Klan lecturers frequently visited Denton to help drum up new recruits, and they were often met by large audiences generated by the local paper's support. Their speeches typically covered in great lengths with high praise afterwards. In January 1925, Methodist preacher and Klan recruiter Reverend W.G. Beasley was introduced by the mayor himself to a crowd that filled the Denton County Courthouse. Klan meetings and recruitment meetings inside our courthouse in November 1925. After the mayor personally passed out and recollected information cards for those interested in learning more or joining the Klan, the large turnout was announced as unquestionably a coordinated effort and praised again in the local DRC. Along with excerpts from Beasley's two-hour speech of the Klan's principles of 100% Americanism. By this time, initiations weren't even a secret. The following summer in 1926, the DRC announced that UDC member Mrs. A.D. Turner would personally host a Klan initiation on her property. So when people ask me why I've hung a sign that says built and paid for by Denton's Klan on that monument, because it was. Was it the UDC who did it? Yes. Were they also Klan members and supporters and the instigators of the second generation Klan in Denton? Yes. It is a monument to the Klan built and paid for by people who were members and supporters of the Klan. As a thoroughly organic movement, the 1920s Klan uniquely expressed itself within Protestant communities of particular localities like Denton, where racialized and apocalyptic evangelizations of local and traveling Klan clerics promised a new super idealized cosmos for whiteness. From 1921 to 1925, circuit recruiters frequently visited Denton and surrounding areas, and the local order relied heavily on their dramatic orations afforded special access to the public square and introduced by prominent citizens like the mayor or leading members of local Protestant churches, the Klan's racist brand of theo-national politics were openly promoted here in Denton for decades. Typically Baptists or Methodists, these militant Protestants preached 100% Americanism, a Klanish term synonymous with pure white Protestant America. Their apocalyptic narratives of an America under attack reverberated across our square right here on this lawn. The country as they saw it was on the brink of extinction under the constant threat of Southern European immigration and equal rights initiatives. Black people, Catholics, and Jews were characterized as ungodly obstacles on the path of an ordained white Protestant America destined to return to an earlier pure state. They rallied Denton citizens with patriotic fervor and they told them repeatedly that the country must be saved for the white Anglo-Saxon race because God created the white race to be supreme. These were the words that were spread and disseminated across this lawn every weekend. And if you stick around for Black Lives Matter protests tonight, you'll hear them tonight right there on that corner from preachers who still preach the same false racialized rhetoric. The Klan is still alive. It is not an organization, it is a movement. It is an ideology of whiteness. It is a cultural epidemic. And we have to learn to recognize it. We have to understand its language. We have to know its symbols so that we can see it so that we can hear it, so that we can expose it, so that we can denounce it. And this monument is part of that. I really need to emphasize how connected the Klan was with the local Protestant community. Because Protestant churches in Denton became hotbeds of clannish theological discourse. All of Denton's Protestant churches engaged in clannish recruitments. But Methodist and Baptist congregations regularly engaged in concurrent recruitment efforts with the local clan throughout the 1920s, and these were highly successful. 
By the end of 1922, local Klan membership already outnumbered the city's First Presbyterian congregation three to one, and it rivaled the Central Presbyterian and First Christian Church congregations. For comparison, from 1920 to 1930, Denton's white population increased by 27%. But the white congregations of both the Methodist and Baptist churches increased at a combined rate of 84%. An astounding 57% higher than the citywide population growth. Never to be seen again in documented history. So as the Klan's distinct brand of theological white supremacy indiscriminately permeated Denton Protestantism at large, local clergy throughout the community continued to tout favorable endorsements for the Ku Klux Klan. First Christian Church Reverend J.M. Perry preached entire sermons dedicated to God's hooded night riders. Reverend Sam J. Barkis of the First Methodist Church regularly advocated for 100% Americans in his clannish sermons. The Central Presbyterian Church hosted a Klan funeral for Dr. W.O. Kimbrough in the fall of 1922 with a four-foot cross comprised of flowers inscribed with the letters KKK placed at the front of the rostrum in the church. Afterwards, eight Klansmen in full regalia attended Kimbrough's graveside service. There was no secrets here. Clannishment, clannishness was patriotism. Denton was a proud city of clannishness. In the spring of 1923, Reverend J.M. Perry conducted a clannish remembrance at the First Christian Church for Dentonite W.C. Pratt, whose graveside commitment services were conducted by local Odd Fellows who were joined by a group of Klansmen in full regalia. Denton Protestantism and clannishness were so infused during the late 1920s, the local order and various denominal congregations were difficult to distinguish from one another. No longer referred to as congregants, members of the Pearl Street Church of Christ became citizens of their church. The same title bestowed to clan persons after they joined the invisible empire of the Ku Klux Klan. By 1925, Denton's Klan was completely amalgamized into all of the churches, and they started their own Go to Church Sunday campaign that sent Klansmen and their families into different churches each week in a concerted effort to spread their Klanish evangelism and recruit new members. According to an update sent to the Wisconsin Courier Klan Journal, these efforts were highly successful and rewarded with enthusiastic support from the local pastorate. Denton's second generation clan that evolved in the 1920s homogenized white supremacy and American patriotism within secular society. Clannish culture thrived, and these people engaged with the cultural apparatuses around them. Clan members infiltrated every aspect of the local community in order to spread their racialized discourse, and through their messaging and activities, I mean, th these things were not only condoned by all whites in the Denton community. Uh, for as well, let me put it this way: for every person who condemned the Klan, and there were there was an anti-Klan movement. I shouldn't dismiss that. I don't know if you saw the Facebook event, the, the picture that I had there, uh, that was taken out of the Denton Record Chronicle by a group of citizens, white citizens, who came together to denounce the Klan, and they started an anti-Klan movement. So there was that element, but for just as many people who condemned it, there were just as many people who were complicitly silent, who allowed it to thrive, who allowed it to become the new normal. Because Klan persons thrived in churches, college campuses, business, fraternal, social organizations, all of the civic and cultural institutions. They went to Klan events with their families, they visited fairs that had Klan as showcases. They saw Klan films in local theaters right here on the square. We had Klan films. They had social gatherings. They had Klan funerals. And the historical archive is full of evidence to suggest that Denton was, in fact, a hub of Klanish culture in the 1920s. 
Long after the national order faded away, Denton's Klan members open in, openly and passionately participated in and supported conservative political movements that aligned their cause and they continued to infiltrate local civic and judicial offices wherever possible. So by consciously and unconsciously engaging with the cultural apparatuses around them, they continued to infiltrate and spread their discourse well beyond the national order's um, decimation. The second generation clan normalized generations of evolving white supremacist ideologies and cleared the way for modern racial discourse and culture. Nearly a century ago, these fervent supremacists launched an America First campaign. Sound familiar? America First? That was their campaign slogan. And it was designed to recall an imaginary, wider, holier America of the past. Put simply, they sought to make America great again. I know that sounds familiar. So I'm going to be here every Sunday at 1 p.m. preaching a gospel of anti-racism by exposing how gospel and patriotism has been exploited by white elites in our past to sustain white power and oppression of black people and indigenous peoples and all peoples of color. And we're going to keep talking about the truth. We're going to keep talking about real contextualized history and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be hard and it's going to be uncomfortable but we're going to continue to do it now before we finish today it might be a good time if everybody wants to you know take a break don't go too far i'd like you to stay i have a very special friend here her name is chelsea stallings and in uh, 2015 right she published her master's thesis through unt entitled quaker town Removing the business, removing, maybe I should let you, removing the danger in a business way. Sorry, friend. Uh, and she was the first to really provide a full contextualized history of Quakertown, the, the black community that was forcibly removed, and explain how it was done and, and, and who was involved. And I'd like to give her an opportunity. I would be remiss if we didn't give a little bit of time to Quakertown today in that community. So if you all would please be so kind to stick around. Um, we're going to let Chelsea Stallings have a little bit of time. And to all of you who came out today to be a part of witnessing truth, thank you very much. And I hope you spread this information to people who need it. Take this information home with you. Don't sit on it. Post it online. Start difficult conversations with people. That person that in your family that drives you nuts because they just don't get it. I've heard a lot of people say, cut them off. Yeah, you can cut them off. But what are you doing when you cut them off? You're being complicit because really what you're saying is, okay, go ahead. I'm not going to participate it, but if you want to go espouse that nonsense, you do it with your friends. And then they're going to find someone who's going to listen to their rhetoric. That's complicitness. We can't just close the door and say, I don't want to play because guess what? It's still happening. Even if you turn your back, it's still happening. We have to have the difficult conversations. We have to say, Mom, you're wrong, and let me tell you why. Dad, you don't know the truth, but let me tell you how you can find it. And this is how we do it. So thank you all very much for coming out. I appreciate you, and I hope you'll come back. Next week, I'm going to move um, into the 1930s and talk about how um, the black community was still deprived the right to vote, even into the 1930s. We're going to move into the civil rights era, and we're going to discuss um, the movements that were taking place uh, through that era. So thank you very much. And Chelsea, I'll give it over to you.